Um, so hello everybody, uh, my name is Rachel Sanchez and as they said, I'm a research fellow uh, in race and anti-racism at Gonville and Keyes College. And today I'm gonna be talking about the, 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 the development of uh, ideas, uh, so more like intellectual history of eugenics in, in Latin America and how does this relate um, to both Weismanian and, and Lamarckian ideas and like what's the, um, um, how does this all link? Um, so just to start, uh, the term eugenics was coined by Francis Galton, who used it in print for the first time in his book, Inquiries into Human Faculty and Its Development, that was published in 1883. So Galton uh, coined the word from the Greek eugenist, namely good in stock. Um, so like to him, like that was hereditarily endowed with noble qualities. So the term responded to a particular um, concern of his, which was the science of improvement improving the stock, a phenomenon he regarded as equally applicable to all men, brutes, and plants. So for Galton, eugenics was not a passive process, uh, but a science which was, as he stressed, by no means confined to questions of judicious uh, mating, but, with, uh, but which, especially in the case of man, takes cognizance of all the influences that tend, in however remote of a degree, uh, to the most suitable races or strains of blood, a better chance of prevailing speedily over the less suitable than otherwise they would have had. So this is all to say that in Galton's view, science had the power and authority to influence and guide individual mating choices in order to ameliorate uh, or better uh, the qualities and potential of the broader population. Next slide, please. Um, however, uh, his ideas like do not come in a vacuum. In an earlier book uh, that he published in 1868 titled Hereditary Genius, Galton actually argued that eminence and talents uh, are closely aligned to quote unquote abler races, a theme that he repeated in later works on eugenics. So basically the most important thing that we need to take out of this is that what differentiated eugenics from other contemporaneous research into these themes was that Galton's explicit interest in applying science to society um, like was made as a means of rationalizing and improving uh, populations on a broader scale. However, he refers specifically to the improvement of the most suitable races. Um, so in this sense, Galton subscribed to racial theories and hierarchies of the time. For example, uh, in his work, Inquiries into Human Faculty and its Development, he saw eugenics as a way of emphasizing particular characteristics that he saw as already inherent uh, to different populations while weeding out uh, the bad traits. And this is where we can observe racializing gender, classist, and ableist undertones in its analysis. Um, so, Weismanian eugenics and Lamarckian eugenics, as you can see from the slide here. Uh, in the decades following Galton's uh, publications, his concept of eugenics was taken up by different scientists and thinkers from all around the world. And they sought to apply his principles to their own social context. The different interpretations of his theories uh, led to a main epistemological split among eugenicists. So this division roughly followed two derivations, one based on the work of French naturalist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, and the other one based on the work of German evolutionary biologist August uh, Weismann. I think as a way of overview, we can say that Lamarckian eugenics uh, tended to look at environmental reasons to explore heredity, uh, as in Weismania eugenics argues that it is uh, down to what we would call now genetics, and it cannot be changed. Uh, however, we're going to be exploring both of them more in detail now. Next slide, please. Um, so Lamarck was a French biologist whose work was very influential all throughout the 19th century. He argued in his theory of transmutation that external influences could alter the germplasm or sex cells. 
uh, the development of neo Lamarckian theory, which was used to challenge Darwinism uh, as a body of theories that explore biological evolution, argued that social and environmental factors played a major role in the improvement of the human stock. So as you can see on the slide, his most famous example was the giraffe. So according to his theories, the giraffe neck uh, grew according to its uh, feeding needs and environmental uh, needs. So this theory uh, was usually more widely accepted among the French, uh, Italian, Russian, and Latin American eugenic circles, uh, where it was used to suggest the importance of environmental factors on hereditary traits and support the fields of poor culture, which is centered on the care of children, and biotypology, which is the study of uh, life forms that share similar hereditary characteristics. Next slide, please. Um, so I put here the rediscovery of Mendel's work. Uh, I know that this is like highly contested. So, uh, but for the purposes of this, I will say rediscovery. Uh, the continuing uh, search for the factors uh, controlling heredity led to three botanists, uh, as you can see on the slide here, to independently and more or less simultaneously rediscover the work of Gregor Mendel uh, during the month of March and April of 1900. Uh, the rediscovery of this work uh, as a way to explain heredity. So Mendel, um, as you already know, was a Czech uh, scientist and Augustinian friar. And what is important about him is that he developed what we now know as the theory of Mendelian inheritance. Basing his experiments uh, of pea plants, he argued that certain characteristics were a product of heredity and patterns of inheritance could be detected by crossing uh, of different pea plants with dominant and receptive characteristics through different generations. Next slide, please. Um, so basically, um, in a sense, like the rediscovery of Mendelian ideas, like supported Weismannian theories uh, that in turn supported uh, Galton's ideas. So basically, Weismannian ideas like talked about the possibility of racial improvement, which he indicated could only be achieved through the mechanism of genetic inheritance. This led to a series of adaptation to modern genetics that allowed for the discussion of eugenics in different scientific circles all throughout uh, the early decades of the 20th century. So Weismann derivation of Galton eugenics, which emphasized the internal hereditary traits rather than environmental factors, had the greatest impact in countries like Germany, Britain, and the United States. Next slide, please. So I'm saying all of this like for us to understand like how the different transnational eugenic connections were formed despite them being associated with either Weismann or with uh, Lamarckian eugenics. So during the early 20th century, eugenicists and eugenic ideas spread all over the world as this was considered a legitimate science. Uh, I think one of the most important things that we need to get out of studying eugenics is that it gave scientific racism the tools for social adaptation. So if we follow Conroy, for example, uh, he argues that eugenics pretty much became a secular religion in which everyone could be a part of. Uh, for example, as you can see here on this slide, uh, Charles Davenport, which is in the bottom here, um, what, who is one of the most famous uh, eugenicists in the US, actually used places like the Caribbean to experiment and put forward his theories against miscegenation. For those of you who don't know what miscegenation is, this is the mixture of the races. Uh, so this was something that was used very differently in every uh, context and we can get uh, to it in the Q&A. Uh, in the case of Davenport specifically, he used, uh, um, he was against the mixing of the races or uh, miscegenation as he was using the US's um, racial understanding of racializing processes and structural racism. He used Jamaica as an example as to why miscegenation was bad, arguing that the offspring of miscegenation was more prompt to criminal acts, feeble-mindedness, among other degenerative uh, pathologies. 
Um, he tried to do a similar thing with Latin American eugenesis by drafting a code of eugenics at the third Pan American uh, meeting of eugenics and poor culture in 1937. Davenport joined forces with people like Domingo Ramos, who was a Cuban eugenicist, um, and they collaborated to create this code, which condemned um, miscegenation. But because Latin America's like main platform relied on mestizaje, or which is racial mixture, most of Latin American eugenicists did not like this. Um, however, Davenport continued to be a part of and participated in many different uh, eugenic societies throughout Latin America, like Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. So despite Davenport being more uh, a more avid supporter of Weismanian eugenics and Latin Americans being more supportive of, of Lamarckian eugenics, did, this did not stop them from converging uh, these theories of heredity and eugenics to produce their own needs um, according to their own uh, context in eugenic societies. Um, however, there's a, there, there are, oh, uh, next slide, please. Um, however, there are other instances in which Lamarckian eugenicists like would collaborate more with each other. For instance, um, Conrado Gini and Gilberto Loyo. So Conrado Gini was an Italian fascist eugenicist and demographer who did a research project with other Italians and Mexican eugenics uh, eugenicists as he believed that the Seri community uh, in Mexico had the purest uh, race of indigenous people. This resulted in a publication titled An Investigation of Some Indian Tribes in Mexico, published in 1934 in one of the most renowned eugenic journals titled Eugenic News. Uh, similarly, Gilberto Loyo uh, was a uh, Mexican demographer that was sent to study eugenics and demography with Conrado Gini in Italy. He then uh, came back to Mexico and did the general population law in Mexico in 1936, which was based on eugenic principles of population control um, and had a lot of like um, exclusionary migratory practices. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in this specific case, we see a clear convergence of Weismanian and Lamarckian eugenics. Uh, Renato Kell was a famous Brazilian eugenics, uh, eugenicist who founded the first eugenic uh, society in Brazil during um, 1917. Even though his, this first society was very short-lived, ideas uh, spread and eugenic practices uh, remained. For instance, in exclusionary migratory laws in Brazil, uh, segregation, hygienic policies, among many others. Uh, for instance, after the abolition of slavery at the end of the 19th century in 1888, uh, which is uh, Brazil is the country that does um, abolition last, uh, Brazil actually put very strict migratory laws that preferred uh, white people from Latin-based uh, countries as a way for them to assimilate to the new and modern Brazilian nation. So Kel's works were mostly about eugenics or Lamarckian eugenics and the support of miscegenation through racial mixture. However, after a research trip to Germany in the 1930s, he started favoring more um, Weismanian versions of um, eugenics. Nonetheless, despite of his newfound connections, uh, some Latin American eugenicists uh, would cherry pick his ideas uh, from like after 1930s, but also before 1930s, depending on their own context and needs. Next slide, please. Um, however, the discussion of eugenic ideas is not particularly a thing of the past. At the Autonomous National University of Mexico or the UNAM, different academics had advocated or still advocate for what they term or what they call new eugenics. Uh, the latest article that I've been able to find uh, was in 20 was published in 2017, as you can see on the slide here, and they do they do have an ongoing uh, research project uh, favoring eugenics as we speak. One of the most prominent academics is now the head of the philosophy um, and letters department. Um, 
And they argue that eugenics or this new version of eugenics is needed. And this new eugenics needs uh, market-based technologies and state regulation as eugenics has been part of our historical nature since the beginning of time. So this idea is like tend to disregard the long history of pathologization and racialization of eugenics that is still present in contemporary racist and structural practices. Next slide, please. Um, however, this is not the only example of the advocacy of uh, contemporary eugenics. For example, here we have Brian Marin. He is a PhD student in economics from the University of Boulder in Colorado. And he recently published a paper in 2020 uh, that brings together data to show that the average height of uh, Puerto Rican men uh, increased by 4.2 centimeters after the US annexation, a euphemism for colonization. Uh, um, and Puerto Rico is an island in, in the middle of the Caribbean. Um, so with the experimentations with um, contraceptives, coercing and making Puerto Ricans to go fight in, in wars for uh, an American passport, forcibly sterilizing them, and even making experimentations with napalm and Agent Orange and nuclear bombs. Like uh, in Puerto Rico, like we can see how like different social inequalities like need to be taken into account before jumping into uh, contemporary forms of scientific racism. But back to Marin. In his article, he used anthropometrics, which is the measuring of body parts to attribute certain moral characteristics, which we saw um, in the other um, uh, article as well, uh, to argue that US colonialism was actually quite beneficial to Puerto Ricans in contrast to the prevailing view in the literature. Um, so his main conclusion in this article is that because US officials brought in resources, food, and education, the life of Puerto Ricans improved, inferred by the increased height of men as a result of colonization. So uh, next slide, please. So just to wrap up and as a form of conclusion, despite the so-called retreat of scientific racism, uh, race is very much embedded in our understanding of society, culture, and scholarship. And we can see that through the different examples of the advocacy of uh, eugenic ideas, even in contemporary times that tend to obscure different social inequalities that are a product of um, local uh, measures in the case of uh, Mexico, and then colonization in the case of uh, Puerto Rico with Brian Marin. Um, and these are just a few examples, like if we, uh, even in the UK, um, there's a lot of like advocacy for um, contemporary eugenics ideas. Um, so I'm gonna leave it here and thank you very much for having me.